This is the second in a series of webinars. The first webinar looked at performing the video head impulse test. This webinar will look at interpreting the results. For those of you who are not familiar with who I am, my name is Lee Martin and I'm an audiologist and international clinical trainer working for the Interacoustics Academy. At the Interacoustics Academy, we have the role to provide training and clinical support regarding the latest technologies which are found in audiological diagnostic equipment. To give you a little about my background, I am an audiologist educated in the UK and have worked both in the public health service in the United Kingdom as well as within the private sector. And I look forward today to introducing you to how we interpret the results obtained from the video head impulse test. The way that we'll structure the webinar is that we'll cover it in several sections. Firstly, I'll provide you with an introduction and this will cover the concept of the video head impulse test and explain some of the data graphs which we obtain when looking at the results. Once we have completed the introduction, we'll talk about the quality of the results which we've obtained. Obtaining good quality results is essential before you make clinical interpretations of the video head impulse test. After we've talked about the quality, we will move on and address the slow phases which are measured with the video head impulse test. What I'm really describing here is the true vestibular response and this is measured by the VOR. Once we have looked at that, it is then important to look if to see if there are any fast phase results. The fast phases correspond to the corrective eye movements which are only present if there is a deficit in the person's vestibular system. I want to make it clear that today's webinar is not an advanced interpretation course. I'm really here to provide you with a basic interpretation of the results which you see on screen. The second thing I will also stress that although we can use the video head impulse test to assess all six semicircular canals, I will be focusing on data which has been obtained using the lateral canals. This is because in the clinical environment, the lateral canal data provides us with the most robust and useful information. So, if you watched the webinar last time, you'll notice that when we're measuring the video head impulse test, what we're really trying to do is to measure the function of the vestibular ocular reflex. So I'll briefly introduce this concept to you again today. Here you can see a video. My eyes are focusing on a target straight in front of me and I'm moving my head to left and right. My eyes are able to stay maintained on the target ahead of me despite my head moving because my vestibular system is telling my eyes to move in an equal and opposite direction to my head. This is the true function of the VOR. And what we want to do with the video head impulse test is to measure how well this VOR is working. Now we spent a lot of time on the last webinar discussing how to perform the test and if you're not familiar with this, then I encourage you to watch that webinar. But once you've completed the examination, what you'll get is a report that looks like this. At first, you may feel a little daunted by all the graphs which it displays, but the results are very concise and easy to understand. And we'll go through each of these graphs individually to give you an idea of exactly what they're showing. The first graphs show the raw tracings which we can record with a video head impulse test you can see that we are displaying velocity as a function of time. And what we do is we compare eye velocity and head velocity. The first thing to note is the color of the background. A blue background tells you that the left canal has been stimulated. A red background tells you that the right canal has been stimulated. On the raw recording, you'll also see several lines. The black line corresponds to the eye movement and the grey line corresponds to the head movement. And what we're looking for on this graph is for the eyes to be moving in an equal and opposite direction to the head because this of course is what the VOR is doing if it's working correctly. The next graphs which we have on the screen are those which show instantaneous gain. The instantaneous gain graphs are very important as these display 
the slow phase response of the VOR and meaning the true vestibular response. So what exactly is instantaneous gain? Well, instantaneous gain can be defined as the eye velocity divided by head velocity. And you can see on the graph that we do this at three different time intervals. Now the way that you calculate gain using the video head impulse test is very important as different systems do this differently. Here I'd like to stress that the IC cam uses the instantaneous gain calculation, which is the same method which is used in the gold standard VOR measurement, which is the scar or coil. And there have been studies to show that the instantaneous gain measured with the IC cam is comparable to coil data. But you can see that we have measured instantaneous gain at three different time intervals, 40, 60, and 80 milliseconds. What the literature currently points to is that we should be focusing primarily on the gain at 60 milliseconds. But what the IC cam does is it allows you to record the gain at 40 and 80 milliseconds, and you can use this information to look at the gain dynamics over time. Now there's interesting research which is beginning to appear in the literature suggesting that certain pathologies can show different gain dynamics. But for the beginner, you're looking at the vestibular head impulse test, then I would suggest really focusing on the gain at 60 milliseconds as this is what will be most useful. The instantaneous gain calculated at 60 milliseconds is a median gain and what you can see is that you get the standard deviations associated with this and this is important because you can look at the quality of the recordings by looking at the standard deviations. In addition to instantaneous gain there's also a second graph on the report which shows a regression analysis. Regression analysis can be used to describe the rate of change in eye movement as the head is moved over the time period 0 to 100 milliseconds. So if we compare the regression analysis to the instantaneous gain, we can say that the regression analysis is therefore an average gain over a wide time window. This allows for lots of data to be analyzed. Now we use the time window 0 to 100 milliseconds as the VOR is contributing only during this time frame. In addition to providing an average gain is that you can use the regression analysis to provide left and right comparisons. Just like in a caloric test, we look for a gain asymmetry between left and right ears. At the top of the regression analysis, we can see that we can do the same with the video head impulse test. And I'll provide you some information on what we consider normal and abnormal a little later. The last graph that we have to analyze is the impulse velocity graph. This graph shows head velocity and gain. And the gain measurement which is displayed here is the instantaneous gain measurement at 60 milliseconds. And each dot on this graph represents each impulse which has been taken. This graph can be used in many different ways, but the first way is to say that we want to ensure that the impulses have been done at appropriate speed, and that's typically greater than 150 degrees per second. And secondly, what you want to do is to make sure that the left and right impulses have been done at a similar velocities so that you can make accurate side-to-side -side comparisons. This is particularly useful when calculating the gain asymmetry. So now that we understand what each of the graphs are showing, this is a result which we would expect to see from a normal individual. Let me go through what we'd expect to see on each graph. Firstly, on the velocity graph, we'd expect to see that the impulses have been conducted at the appropriate speed, and in this case, we want them to be greater than 150 degrees per second, and we want to make sure that the right and left impulses are comparable to each other, and we can see in this example they are. The next thing we should look at is the, the raw eye data, and what we want to see is that the eye movement to mirror the head movement, and a truly normal system will show eye movements which are equal and opposite to the head movement. Then what we want to do is look at the instantaneous gain graphs. And what we want to do is to make sure that the gain is as close to one as possible. However, there has been a boundary set 
that when we get to the figure of roughly 0.7 and greater, we consider this to be normal. At the bottom here, I've provided you with some literature providing some normal gain values, but we'll discuss gain values and what's considered exactly normal and abnormal a little later. Lastly, we should look at the regression analysis and again, look for the gain value. Expect this to be greater than 0.7, but also look at the gain asymmetry. And we want this to be less than roughly 7%. And this 7% figure has been taken from again, a normative data study. So if all four graphs correspond to information like this, then we can say that the video head impulse test in an individual is normal. But what happens if the graphs don't look like this? In order to assist you, what I've done is I've provided you with three steps which you should do when interpreting the video head impulse test. So firstly, we need to look at the quality. Secondly, we need to look at the slow phases or the vestibular response. And then lastly, we need to look at the fast phases or the corrective response. So we'll tackle each one of these individually. Firstly, let's look at the quality. When we discuss quality, we need to ask three questions. Have you collected enough data? Do the impulses you've collected contain artifacts? And have you performed the impulses at the appropriate velocity? So let's have a look at some data. Here we can see the results from a video head impulse test. The first question you want to ask is have you collected enough impulses? You can see this by the figures in these top left-hand corners of the raw tracing graphs. And we can see that we've collected nine impulses on the left and 15 impulses on the right. Typically, you want to have greater than five impulses on each side in order to consider that you have enough impulse data. Secondly, what you want to do is to look at whether or not you've performed the impulses at the appropriate velocity. If you perform the impulses at a too slow velocity, then you'll only be stimulating both sides. And what we want to do is to stimulate each lateral canal individually. So therefore, we have to impulse the head at an appropriate speed. In order to look at the velocity of the head impulses, what you can do is use the graph at the bottom here. And as I showed earlier, you can draw imaginary line at 150 degrees per second. And what you want to see is that your V hit data and impulses are greater than this line. Lastly, you want to make sure that the left and right impulses are comparable. And again, this can be seen by drawing an imaginary box around the dots. And you want to see that there's an equal spread of left, blue, and red, right dots. Once you have this information, you then need to check for any artifacts present in the data. Here we can see an example of a very poor V-hit recording. And what you can see is that in the, uh, the camera image is that the eye and the pupil are right on the edge of the frame. And this is going to mean that when the head is impulsed, the eye is going to fall outside of the frame and you're not going to get very good data. And this is where we see a loss of um, the recording. So these are not true pathological jumps. This is just the fact that the eye is jumping out of the screen. Another way you can look at the quality of the recordings is to look at the standard deviations associated with the instantaneous gain. If these are very large, then what this can say is that the goggle could be slipping or the, there could be a problem in your technique and it would be best to repeat the measurement before making the clinical interpretation. The next thing you want to do is to look at the eye movements and the head movements and make sure that they're in phase with each other. If they're not in phase then this can suggest that the goggles have slipped. A good way to check that they are in phase is to draw an imaginary line down the center of the peak velocity and what you expect to see is that the eye the head velocity and the eye velocity peak at the same point if this does not happen then again we recommend that you repeat the video head impulse test lastly the regression analysis can also show signs of slippage when you see a goggle slippage we often see a high gain and we can also see that these gray areas show a very large and wide data spread. This is, will be associated with poor quality impulses or a goggle slippage, and we should repeat the recordings. So 
If we make it through the quality analysis and we, and we deem our data to be appropriate, then the first thing we should do is to assess the vestibular response or the slow phase. So when we're discussing the video head impulse test, this of course corresponds to the gain measurements which we're recording. So there's a few questions which you should ask. What is the instantaneous gain value? And what is the regression gain value? Secondly, you want to know whether or not they're within the normal range. And then thirdly, you want to know whether or not there's a significant gain asymmetry between left and right sides. Now, when I go to clinics all over the world, I always get the question, can you provide me with an exact cutoff for what's deemed normal and abnormal on the video head impulse test? And the true answer is that it's really important that each clinic obtains their own clinical norms because what you'll find is that the normative data can shift depending on the technique which you've used to measure the video head impulse test and also the individual using it. What the literature says is that we typically find that 0.7 is the cutoff value for what is normal and abnormal but we can see that two studies show a lower gain value of 0.79 and a second study showing a lower gain value of 0.76. So there are differences between different studies and that's completely acceptable. And this is why it's really important for you to generate your own clinical norms. If you do not want to generate your own clinical norms, then it's acceptable to use 0.7 as a cutoff point. The thing to remember with any normative value is that you have to analyze this figure in relation to the results which you're getting on screen. If you're getting a very asymmetrical response suggesting maybe 1.0 gain in the left hand side or 0.71 on the other side and then there's the presence of catch-up saccades with this low value gain then you would consider this that there's a potential abnormality there and you would need to do some more analysis. So normal values are great, but we need to analyze them within the context of the whole result. So here we can see a result of somebody which has a pathological video head impulse test. And what you can see is that there are gain differences um, between the two sides. We can see that in the instantaneous gain, on the right hand side we have a figure of 0.76. But on the left hand side we have a figure of 0.27. Remember that if this is below 0.7 then we're considering that a pathology is present. If we look at the slow phase on the eye recording or the raw tracing we can see that the eye movement is not equal to the head movement and this is why the gain value is low. If we look at the regression analysis again we can see that the same difference exists between the right side and the left side but in addition we can get a percentage difference and we can look at the gain asymmetry. So let's look at that now. According to a normative data study from Leonel Lewis's clinic in Portugal uh, they use a gain uh, asymmetry figure of 7% to deem an abnormal asymmetry between sides. Here we can see that we have a gain asymmetry figure of 37%. Again, this is over the 7% with associated low gains on one side and therefore we can use this to say that the left side is the weakest side. But of course what we also need to do then is after we've looked at these slow phase responses we then also need to look at the fast phase corrective eye movements. And this is exactly what we'll do now. So one of the questions which you need to look at when looking at the fast phases. Firstly, you need to ask the question, are saccadic eye movements present? Secondly, you need to ask the question, how consistent are they? You also need to note the direction which they're present in. Lastly, you need to look at whether they're overt, covert or mixed. And there's a little note at the side you can also look at the amplitude of the saccadic movement as this can give you information also. What I thought I'd do is to go back to an example which I showed you in the first webinar 
which is of a pathological uh, video head impulse test, which you can see the catch up eye movement at the bedside. So when this lady's head is thrusted to the right, her eyes maintain target. To the left, there's a catch up saccade. To the right, maintain target. To the left, the eyes have to jump back to the center. Right, normal. To the left, the eyes have to jump back. So what does this result look like on a video head impulse test? It's really important for us to be able to see how this would actually display and what the catch up eye movement looks like as this is the fast phase. So here we can see a raw tracing eye movement of the lady which we have just tested and this is the result which we get. So first of all what you can see is that you have the head velocity here in grey and the eye velocity in black. And firstly you can see that the head velocity is peaking um, at like 150 degrees per second but we can see that the eye velocity is only peaking at just over 100 degrees per second. So there's an asymmetry difference. So what we can say is that the eye is moving unequally to the head. Because there's an unequal movement what the system has to do is to make a corrective movement at some point in time. And in this example, what we can see is that the head has been impulsed and the head has then stopped moving. And then what we can see with the eye is that after the head has stopped moving, there's this catch up eye movement. When the, this catch up eye movement occurs, after the head has stopped moving, we call this an overt saccade. And this is exactly what we saw with the lady. However, last time we explained that the main purpose of having the video head impulse test is for people where you can't see an overt saccade. And we can see in this example that it looks as if this gentleman can focus on the target ahead of him without any catch up eye movements. However, when we record the video head impulse data from him, we can see that we get a graph that looks a little bit like this. So what's this graph showing? Well, first of all, it is showing exactly the same as what the first graph is showing. The head is moving in one direction and the eyes are moving in an equal and opposite direction, but the eyes are not moving equally. You can see that the head is moving and peaking at almost 200 degrees per second, whereas the eye is only moving and peaking at just over 100 degrees per second. Therefore, the system needs to make a corrective eye movement to catch up. In blue, you can see I've highlighted this corrective movement. But the big difference between the gentleman's eye movement and the lady's eye movement is that his corrective eye movement is happening during the head impulse. And this is what we call a covert saccadic eye movement. And the IC cam or the video head impulse test is the only test you can use to measure this movement because doing a clinical bedside assessment you cannot see this. If we see these overt or covert eye movements we then need to ask the four questions which I mentioned on the previous slide. So are these catch-up saccades present? And yes we can see that on this example we're getting catch-up saccades during the head movement so these are covert saccades and then after the head movement and we can say that these are overt saccades. We've identified that they're present, but not all saccades which are present necessarily mean that there's a pathology there. Then after you've identified that they're saccades, you need to ask a second question. And this question is how consistent are they? Are we getting impulses and then catch up saccades after every head movement? Or are they only occurring very infrequently? The literature suggests that you need to be seeing catch-up saccadic eye movements on greater than 50% of the time as to consider a video head impulse test to be pathological. Remember, what you want to do is to look at the gain, and if the gain is truly low, then we'd expect to see an associated catch-up saccadic eye movement. So therefore, we expect the consistency of these saccades to be high.
And one thing to note that people with normal vestibular function can on occasions show catch ups of cards. And this is why it's important to make sure that the catch ups of cards are consistent when looking at pathology. The next question you should ask is what direction are the catch up saccadic eye movements occurring? When there's a vestibular deficit and the eye is making a corrective movement back to the target, then what we'd expect to see is that the catch up saccadic eye movements or the fast phases are in the same direction as the VOR eye movements. So we can see that as the eye is moving in this direction, as are the catch-up saccadic eye movements. If the catch-up saccadic eye movements are moving in the opposite direction to the VOR eye movements, then you need to ask some questions. Here is an example of where we can see some catch-up saccadic eye movements across the time frame, but we can see that we have catch-up saccadic eye movements on the right-hand side and also on the left-hand side. Now, if you're not looking at the gain here, you might consider that there's a bilateral weakness as both sides are producing catch-up saccadic eye movements. However, what you can do is you also need to look at the direction. Now, what we can see is that on the right-hand side, the VOR eye movement is going in this direction, but we can see that the catch-up saccadic eye movements are moving in the opposite direction to the VOR. On the left hand side, we can see the same movements occurring here, here, and here. If we highlight all these boxes, we can see that both sides are showing saccadic eye movements. But interestingly, these saccadic eye movements or fast phases are occurring before the head has started to be moving. What we say this is, is actually it's not a corrective eye movement for the head impulse, but actually this is a spontaneous nystagmus. And we can identify a spontaneous nystagmus because it always beats in the same direction. And you'll notice it before the head has started to be moving. So we can see that on this example, there's a beating nystagmus on the left-hand side in the direction of the VOR, but we know that it's not a corrective movement to correct for the head impulse because it's happened before the head has started to be moved. Then when we look at the right hand side, we can see that this, present, this movement is also present on the right side and also that the, this movement is in the opposite direction of the VOR. So when we see this, we can actually use this information to say, okay, on this example, this is actually showing the spontaneous nystagmus. But if we look at the gains, and we can eyeball this, we can see that the right side is roughly moving equally and opposite to the left. So we have a gain value of 0.79 at the bottom. But on the left-hand side, we can see that the eye definitely is not moving equal and oppositely to the head. So we expect to see some fast phases present in here. And what you can see in this example is that there are a cluster of fast phases here moving in the direction of the VOR. And this is what we'll classify as the true catch-up saccadic eye movement. The one thing you can also notice about the true saccadic eye movement is that its amplitude is much greater than that of the spontaneous nystagmus which has been recorded before the head has been moved. So the direction of the fast phase is very important when discussing the video head impulse test. Lastly, what you can do is to identify whether or not the saccades are overt occurring after the head movement or covert during occurring during the head movement as this can be used by physical therapists and those involved with vestibular rehabilitation to make an assessment on how well the patient is compensating over time. Now I won't go into too much details regarding this but there are some interesting papers looking at how the VOR can restore itself over time and what happens to overt and covert saccades. So when we're going to interpret the V-hit, then there's really three steps which we need to do. The first is to look at the quality of the results. And when we look at the quality of the results, we want to eliminate artifacts and we can delete individual 
impulses which contain artifacts so that we can get a good clean data set. Once we've deleted the artifacts, if we still have noisy data, then it's really important that we repeat the test. Otherwise, you're not going to be getting true vestibular response and we need to be analyzing this. So making sure that we have good quality data is essential. Once we know that the data we've obtained is of good quality, then we need to look at the slow phase eye movements. And when we talk about the slow phase eye movements, this is looking at the vestibular response and we express this as a gain value. We have two gain values, instantaneous gain and regression gain. And typically, we advise you to generate your own normative data. If you're not using your own normative data, then you can use a published normative data or use 0.7 as your cutoff point. But remember, you also need to look at the gain value in association with the fast phase eye movements. A pathological slow phase or low gain, if it's truly the vestibular problem, must be corrected by a fast phase saccadic eye movement. So the presence of these eye movements must be high and we need to note the direction, the consistency and the type of eye movement which is occurring in the fast phase. Once you have all this information, then you have a good idea of what's going on in this person's V-hit result. Now what we'll do is we'll finish the, the webinar here for today and I hope this has given you some basic guidelines for you to follow if you're new to performing video heli impulse testing and you want to get some guidance on how to interpret the result. So I thank you very much for listening today and I encourage you to visit the Intraacoustics Academy website where you can find not only webinars but also e-learning e material, product tutorials as well as academic references and key published article papers which can be used to increase your understanding of the video head impulse test. So thank you very much for listening and goodbye.